All right, welcome back. Uh, this is going to be Unit 1B. So in this section, we're going to talk about libel and defamation. Uh, and there's going to be three cases we talk about. The first is New York Times v. Sullivan in 1964. The second is Gertz v. Robert Welch, Inc., 1974. And the third is Hustler Magazine v. Jerry Falwell, 1998, which is a fun case. So, okay, here we go. The first case, New York Times versus Sullivan in 1964. The court unanimously, 9-0, to zero, decided to reverse both the district court and the Alabama State Supreme Court. And Justice Brennan delivers the opinion. So, Sullivan is a city commissioner, city commissioner in Montgomery, Alabama, and he is in charge of running the police and the fire station. Um, he filed defamation claims against four black Alabamans and the New York Times and won a half a million dollars in the lower courts. Um, the Alabama Supreme Court affirmed the lower court ruling of a half a million dollars. Um, so the context here is that the New York Times took out a full page ad against 64 Alabama officials citing their terror against civil rights movements and civil rights protesters. Um, Sullivan, who was the police, uh, the city commissioner, or one of the city commissioners, basically he makes no claim of financial loss. Um, and the court, the Supreme Court, says that the original judge in the original district court case really screwed up by not informing the jurors the distinction between punitive damages, which are the fines you pay for breaking a law, and the compensatory damages, which are uh, compensation paid for defamation to Sullivan. And the judge didn't distinguish between those. So there's no way of telling what was compensatory and what was punitive, um, which is problematic, according to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court rules that. The lower courts acted unconstitutionally by failing to protect the plaintiff's First and Fourteenth Amendment rights. Um, they say basically that publishers are protected and, quote, we consider this case against the background of a profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, wide open, and that it may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. Another quote, the constitutional protection does not turn upon the truth, popularity, or social utility of the ideas and beliefs which are offered. That means like even the most sort of obnoxious and dastardly speech or press um, is still constitutionally protected. Uh, so at Texas Tech, you know, in the 2000s when I was there, a local KKK group would go around and put flyers on people's cars in the TTU parking lot. And TTU had to allow them to do that because as obnoxious as that sort of behavior and speech is, it is protected by the Supreme Court in sort of the, what they call the, um, um, the public discourse or um, the marketplace of ideas, it's often called, um, but it's, it's still protected. They also say, criticisms of official conduct do not lose constitutional protection merely because it is effective criticism and hence diminishes official reputations. So just because it's criticism doesn't mean that they can ban it. And they also say the fine that the courts tried to put forth was crazy, a half million dollars in the 60s. And fines like that could be used against the New York Times and any other single person associated with the article, giving Alabama the ability to basically cause fear in that publication and curb their free speech um, through the fear of being bankrupted, basically. And so they also ruled that the courts cannot institute the fine either. And in the second concurrence, um, it goes, it says that the court should have gone further, actually, 
than saying that states can still suppress news articles that print falsehoods with, quote, actual malice. They think that actual malice should also be allowed. <clears throat> okay, so 10 years later, we visit Gertz versus Robert Welch Incorporated in 1974. And the vote came down five to four, very close. And um, the lower court is upheld, uh, basically upheld the New York Times v. Sullivan standard, the, this very strict ability for the government to be able to uh, restrict press. Um, so again, it's a five to four decision and they uphold the lower court um, and they uphold the Sullivan standard. And Justice Powell delivers the opinion. Um, it's basically here, he says, all right, there's a distinction between the Sullivan case and this case, because now the def the defamation is against a private citizen rather than the uh, a public official. Um, so the context is, in 1968, a Chicago police officer named Nuccio killed a young man named Nelson. Nuccio was found guilty of second-degree murder. But then Nuccio was sued by Nelson's family in civil court. Um, a, a, a sort of publication, a far-right newsletter monthly uh, called American Opinion, thought that a was pushing this sort of conspiracy theory that there's a push in police departments um, for communists to take over policing organizations and that the communist organization that was trying to take over the Chicago Police Department uh, framed Nuccio for the murder of Nelson. Uh, the petitioner files a libel suit against American opinion. Uh, the Nelsons, basically. Their, his family files a libel suit. Um, and American opinion, the, the, the News Monthly, cited... Uh, the Sullivan case and claimed that it had not published the article with, quote, actual malice. So what differentiates this case from Sullivan? Uh, first, the person being defamed is not a public official like he was in Sullivan, who was um, a city councilor. Um, but rather, the, the Nelsons are just normal everyday citizens. Uh, and the court, the Supreme Court, states that there should be a different standard than the Sullivan case when dealing with private citizens rather than public officials. Public officials are open to criticism. Private uh, citizens are less so, right? Um, so why? First, public officials have many more channels and resources to fight back against libel, uh, whereas the normal everyday citizen does not. Uh, second, the citizens will be more harmed than a public official. Um, and third, citizens don't sort of sign up for that kind of scrutiny, right? Public officials do. They expect scrutiny. They expect accountability. They expect journalism. Um, an average everyday citizen does not and shouldn't have to uh, maintain that sort of standard. And so the court rules that states may set up their own standards concerning defamation when private citizens are concerned, um, and that uh, American opinion did, in fact, defame um, um, the, the Nelson family. All right, so the final case is Hustler Magazine versus Jerry Falwell in 1998. So this is about 25 years later. Um, so the decision, first of all, was a unanimous decision, an eight to zero reversal of the lower courts, and the majority is written by Chief Justice Rehnquist. Okay, so um, Jerry Falwell, who is a very famous evangelical preacher and uh, started a conservative religious college, I think is called American University, um, and also uh, was busted in the 2010s um, for a sex scandal involving his wife and a pool boy. Um, he got real weird. He was asked to step down from the university. But before that, in 1998, Jerry Falwell sues Hustler magazine for, quote, invasion of privacy, libel, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. The lower court rules that 
Falwell, because he's a public official, he's a very famous person, he often talked to presidents, he had a TV show, etc., um, did not have a right to privacy because of the Sullivan ruling. Um, the jury found that there actually was no defamation because Hustler magazine included a disclaimer on their little fake ad, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the jury did find that Hustler magazine had caused the Falwell family emotional damages and awarded, awarded them uh, $100,000 um, plus punitive fines. Um, and basically, the Supreme Court says, okay, we're not going to rule on number one, where um, where the, the Jerry Falwell has a right to privacy because he doesn't, according to uh, the New York Times versus Sullivan standard. We're not going to rule on whether defamation occurred because the jury already ruled on this. We are going to rule on emotional damages. Okay. Um, so basically the context for this is that Penthouse magazine created a fake advertisement for uh, some booze company um, and, and, and inserted uh, photos of Jerry Falwell and a fake interview with Jerry Falwell um, in which he claims that his first time having sex was when he drunkenly slept with his mother in an outhouse. Um, <laughs> and uh, the Hustler ad did include a, a disclaimer saying that this is obviously a parody um, and that none of this should be taken seriously. Um, the Court of Appeals, uh, we talked about earlier, the lower court ruled that Falwell didn't have a right to privacy, that there was no defamation because of the disclaimer, but that he had emotional damages and um, Hustler had to pay $100,000. Um, um, the Court of Appeals upheld all of those rulings and the Supreme Court granted cert and said, we want to look at this case. Uh, while the jury ruled that there was no libel per se because of the disclaimer, uh, the appeals court ruled that damages can still be awarded despite Sullivan um, because of, quote, actual malice, and there was actual malice. Um, they say it was, quote, sufficiently outrageous to constitute intentional infliction of emotional distress. Um, however, the Supreme Court ruled that Falwell is up a creek, right? Um, that they're not going to protect him and he will not receive his $100,000 for emotional distress. Why did they make this ruling? Quote, thus, while such a bad motive as the advertisement, um, while such a bad motive may be deemed controlling for the purpose of tort liabilities in other areas of the law, we think the First Amendment prohibits such a result in the area of public debate about public figures. Um, and they go on to suggest that there would be serious uh, consequences for things like political cartoonists, for playwrights um, who write satire and political controversy, for television writers, um, for satirists, um, etc. Their final ruling says uh, the court will not allow for penalties against Hustler magazine, despite the fact that the, the defamation was, was made with actual malice and that public figures are not protected by actual malice rules. All right. Okay. Uh, that's the end of this little section. I'll see you for the next one. Have a great day.